Okay folks, welcome to another introductory anatomy lecture. Today we'll be going over the basics of lymphatics, vasculature, and some other basic systems that you'll see in the body, but aren't specifically covered in any individual unit, though you might see them appear in multiple units. So this is kind of a good place to get a base knowledge of just anatomy in general. Make sure you're paying attention to the objectives when you go over this lecture. We'll start with vascular and lymphatics. So, in order for the body to sustain itself, it needs to get its nutrients from one part of the body to the other. And that's done through the vascular system. So whenever blood is being transported away from the heart containing nutrients or any sort of substance like oxygen that will be essential for the body to be alive, uh, those are carried in arteries. Um, and the arteries are going to be a thick wall, they're going to be very muscular and very rigid. Um, and you can see those in anatomy, uh, they kind of hold their shape. Compare that to veins. Now anything that goes back to the heart is going to be done in a vein. Uh, veins tend to be under a lot less pressure, so they're a little more um, thin. Uh, they can be flatter when you see them, uh, less muscular, and some of them will actually have valves. So anything coming back to the, the heart will, will basically be under less pressure, so we don't need the rigidity of the arteries for that. Now, a couple of key notes is not everything that's oxygenated is an artery. So one of the classic examples is we'll see the pulmonary artery. Uh, is taking blood away from the heart and going into the lungs and that is actually deoxygenated blood so it doesn't necessarily have to have all the nutrients but it has to be something that is leaving the heart just like veins pulmonary veins do have oxygenated blood and those are coming back to the heart into the left atrium so uh, it's not always whether or not it's uh, oxygenated or not oxygenated it's a question of is it leaving the heart or going to the heart so the other thing to be mindful of is arteries and veins are connected by capillary beds uh, so these are going to be where the nutrient exchange happens uh, these are very small microscopic structures that you won't see in anatomy uh, and you can see under a microscope but they're so thin that they allow the transport of nutrients chemicals oxygen anything to the surrounding tissue and that sort of bridges the gap is once you get into the capillary bed the next place you leave is in the venous uh, return system so overall veins tend to be a little bit larger uh, and more expandable um, and one thing you'll notice is that if you were looking in the body you would notice most of the arteries are actually um, empty and most of the blood is found in the veins. So about 80% of our blood is actually in the veins at any given time, uh, just because they can be a little more elastic and more receptive of that blood flow, uh, whereas the high pressure arterial system tends to evacuate that blood relatively quickly. Now, in order to properly understand uh, our blood vessels, we should be uh, aware of their basic anatomy. Now, a lot of this stuff you won't really see on a blood vessel, but on the bigger ones, you can kind of differentiate their three layers. Uh, but these layers are called tunics or coats. So let's start with the tunica intima. So intima means the innermost layer. So you can think tunica intima or inside kind of sounds similar. And it's just a single layer of epithelial cells. And this is where a lot of the exchange of nutrients can happen. And if we're talking about a capillary bed, it's only got the epithelial cells there. The middle layer is called the tunica media. So media, middle, kind of sounds similar. Uh, and this is pretty much composed of all your smooth muscles. And, and depending on what vessel we're looking at, it can give it some of the contractility uh, contractility or the rigidity that we'll see in certain vessels but that's going to house all your smooth muscle uh, and then finally the outer layer is the tunica adventitia uh, and so that's just a layer of connective tissue surrounding this the the vessel itself and usually you can see that kind of differentiates itself between the um the smooth muscle layer and then the the outermost layer which is just going to be some um, various forms of connective tissue loose and dense uh, and usually there's going to be, a, um, particularly in arteries, we'll see a, a elastic membrane that might divide that. But that's nothing you'll have to worry about until you start looking at the microscopy of it. We're really worried about gross anatomy. All right, so let's take a look at arteries. We can break arteries down into three different types. There's going to be a large, uh, also known as elastic arteries. We can talk about medium arteries, which are the muscular arteries. And we can talk about the small arteries, also known as arterioles. So the large arteries are the ones you see, when you open up the body, they just stand right out to you. So the aorta is the classic example. You see that coming out from the heart, descending down the thorax, all the way to the abdomen, just this big, gorgeous vessel. And that is a large elastic artery. It needs to handle that cardiac output. So they need to be rigid. They need to be able to sustain a lot of pressure from that heart and be able to hold themselves. So we don't want to any sort of tears in the wall. So these um, contain a lot of elastic fibers that allow them to expand and kind of just retract. So what happens is these, these um, vessels will expand with the output of uh, cardiac flow. And then as that elastic fibers sort of contract, it's gonna keep that blood pressure consistent. So the heart pushes out, it expands, and then it kind of contracts out, which is gonna keep pushing the blood. So you get this kind of semi-continuous flow of blood uh, in these large arteries. When we get to the medium arteries, so these are gonna be most of your named arteries that you see in the body. So once you get off the branches of the aorta, a lot of those are gonna be muscular arteries. 
They're referred to as muscular arteries because they tend to have a lot of smooth muscle fibers in their tunica media. Now, what is that used for? Well, this helps regulate flow of blood. So um, for things like your fight or flight response, when you need to get your adrenaline to pump in, you need all that uh, blood supply to go to your legs and arms to get away, we don't really care about digesting foods. So some of those named arteries that are in your digest <laughs> digestive tract can vasoconstrict and allow for more blood flow to go to the areas that you want it to go to. Um, so we also see some regulation occur in the arterioles and this is really important for um, moderating overall vascular pressure. And when we have things like um, high tone in our arterioles or lack of um, response, appropriate response in our arterioles, that's when we can get things like hypertension. So that actually occurs in the arterioles. It's a problem with the arterial regulation. And basically you get too much pressure in your arterioles. It causes way too much tone. They're basically just always kind of under this pressure uh, um, environment. And that's where we get hypertension, and that's gonna have a lot of backflow problems uh, that we'll see throughout anatomy, and even in your clinical year. Uh, usually you won't see arterioles uh, anatomically speaking, so you'll never be quizzed on them uh, as far as just knowing what they basically are. Um, and those are things you'll see microscopically. But those are gonna be the distal ones right before we hit into the capillary beds. They're in arterioles, then capillary beds. So a couple of things to think about clinically is atherosclerosis. So a lot of people are um, familiar with the term atherosclerosis, that's actually a subdivision of arteriosclerosis. So any sort of hardening of the arteries, when the arteries basically lose their elasticity. So if we have the aorta, we want it to be flexible and be able to move, but if for some reason it can't, uh, it might be under um, any sort of ather atero, sorry, arteriosclerosis. So sclerosis means hardening. So the most common type is atherosclerosis, and that's a buildup of flatty, fatty plaques in the um, tunica uh, intima and tunica media. So what happens is these cholesterol deposits actually get underneath the tunica intima and start creating these plaques. Uh, and they start narrowing the lumen, they start um, potentially causing sort of hypertensive conditions, especially if we're uh, doing this in the, um, the smaller arteries, like your arterioles. Um, and eventually what we can do is we can, we can lead an infarct. Uh, to occur, which is basically a lack of oxygen flowing to a particular area of the body. So if you keep narrowing that lumen, if it becomes uh, harder and harder for blood to get through, not only do we increase our back pressure, which is gonna cause the hypertension, but now we're worried about now blood's not getting where it needs to be, and we might see that in a way, um, in the shape of an infarct. Uh, also, these plaques can potentially break off, or you can get some platelet formations that form on these plaques if they get a little bit of erosion. Um, and those basically just start creating these like, um, uh, clots inside the blood vessel. Uh, the problem with that is, A, we're also narrowing our lumen, so those are called thrombus if it stays in place, but the thrombus are at risk of breaking off and becoming an emboli. So atherosclerosis is really problematic because it basically just uh, disrupts our normal homeostasis in the blood vessel, uh, and so it's really important to monitor those things because they have a lot of systemic consequences. Now, when we're talking about infarcts, any sort of disruption of blood can lead to an infarct. So we have a couple of examples of that. A lot of blood supply might actually have anastomosis and have redundancies. So we'll see this in the lungs. The lungs have a lot of blood coming from a lot of different areas. You have your bronchial arteries, you have your pulmonary arteries. It's getting blood from the aorta, it's getting blood from the heart. Um, so if there's blockage in some of those, we can still get an infarct, but we refer to that as an, a red infarct because blood's still getting through, but there's not enough blood is getting through, not enough oxygen is getting through which means the blood will, or the uh, tissue will eventually die, but it still has blood kind of in that area. You know, it's like flooded with blood. Um, and kind of a weird way to think about it. Uh, contrast that to something that has a terminal blood flow. So the spleen is a good example down here. You can see uh, we get white infarcts in the spleen because it only has one direction. Basically your splenic artery, if that starts to, to narrow or cause issues or we get infarct there, Blood's not coming from anywhere else, and what happens is you just get fibrous tissue buildup, and it becomes this white scar tissue in the organ. So um, just be mindful that you can see red infarcts versus white infarcts, but anytime we talk about tissue basically being um, uh, deprived of oxygen or deprived of nutrients, it can ultimately die, and that's when we start seeing an infarct. All right, so capillaries, uh, we kind of mentioned them. They're just basically tunic intimas, uh, allowing for the transportation of nutrients from um, from the arteries uh, and passage through the veins. Everything gets dumped out and it basically works under a hydrostatic pressure. So you have a high under hydrostatic pressure in the arterial end. It basically forces all your um, nutrients out into the uh, surrounding extracellular fluid. 
And then um, anything that's not used or anything that can come back basically just gets pulled back right before it goes back into the venous return. So you get a massive dump of nutrients. Uh, the decrease in hydrostatic pressure just before you get to the venules uh, causes some of that to go back so we don't get a complete loss of fluid. Um, but this is just where transportation occurs. And we, we refer to this network. It's not a single vessel. It's actually a network of vessels. And we refer to that as a capillary bed. So now looking at our veins, we can again divide those into three parts. So we're basically going from leaving the heart all the way back to the heart. So once we've left the capillaries, now we're gonna see ourselves in the venules or the small veins. We'll also have medium veins and then we'll have large veins, kind of similar to what we saw in the artery. So everything that leaves the, the capillary blood, everything that leaves the capillary beds is gonna actually drain into these venous um, venules. And a lot of times what you'll get is these venous complexes or these venous plexuses. Uh, which are sort of like capillary beds, but a little bit bigger and they allow for a little bit of redundancy So you see a lot of these in like um, around the esophagus region around the um, rectal region uh, um, It's sort of just they wrap themselves around the arter arteries there and they kind of just have this like redundancy of blood flow and We'll take a look at those in just a minute uh, These venous plexuses are eventually going to drain into the medium veins. A lot of the medium veins are your named veins and just note that just like your arter arterioles, venules are almost too small to see except with a microscope. So we're not really looking for those, but medium veins are pretty much all the other veins like the, the cephalic and basalic veins you see in the arm, uh, the saphenous vein, all those superficial veins. Uh, these often are found with um, valves. So what happens is these valves will basically prevent blood from falling back. And we'll take a look at that in just a moment here. And then finally, you have your large uh, veins, which is basically your uh, vena cavas. So we're returning blood to the heart. And you can kind of see the central line here, without me getting a little bit too fuzzy, uh, those big um, vessels in the middle. So it makes sense that all our large stuff is kind of um, centrally located, and then you have the medium stuff peripherally located, and then further out, you're gonna have your uh, small items there. Um, but the large veins contain a lot of smooth muscle. They're a lot more uh, expandable, right? So we said that 80% of our blood is gonna be in these, um, these veins. So uh, the other thing to note is they do have a very prominent tunica adventitia. So um, if you were to look at a cross section, you can almost see a lot of the connective tissue on the outer side, uh, even without the use of a microscope. So I mentioned venous plexuses and venous valves. So a venous plexus is just a collection of small veins. Um, so a lot of times you'll see when you uh, were to look at a body, you kind of just see this plexus of the veins. The arteries tend to be a little more um, unique and singular uh, where veins just sort of mesh out. Uh, so the dorsum of the foot, if you're looking at the back of the foot, uh, you can see that they'll just be a, a network of veins. They are basically uh, grossly identifiable capillary beds, but they're uh, kind of any then this in formation, uh, rectal plexuses and esophageal plexuses. So the problem with these is they can allow, so A, they're a sense of redundancy. So we talked about the the, the, the idea of an infarct, um, but they also allow anastomosis. So they can potentially lead to things like varices or, or um, uh, hemorrhoids, which we'll take a look at shortly when we talk about clinical settings. Uh, venous valves are basically these little cups of endothelial tissue, uh, and they just, try to prevent the backflow of blood through uh, gravity. So blood trying to get under back to the heart is not under pressure like in the arterial system. So we need to have these valves in place because if you're standing still, the blood is just gonna keep falling back down. And those veins are designed to expand and just take it uh, and hold as much blood as they can possibly hold. So these valves basically prevent the backflow of blood. And they work through muscular contraction. So it's kind of a really neat apparatus. Basically these veins are kind of uh, entwined between our muscular, um, our various muscle groups and just by moving active uh, being active and doing a lot of uh, physical uh, activity kind of just compresses these veins and allows the blood to just kind of move forward and then rather than falling all the way back it's caught by a valve and then just kind of stays put until the next set of movements just keeps pushing it so it's kind of like a squeeze um, action as we make our way back to the heart so uh, sometimes if we have issues with the veins or, or vein um, uh, insufficiency we can see things in uh, like a varicose vein. So what happens is the veins basically swell abnormally. And what you'll see there is you can actually see how uh, the superficial veins are kind of just more prominent through the skin because basically there's an increased venous pressure, blood is falling down, the veins basically become, or the valves become incompetent uh, and blood can just keep pooling up in the leg and becomes harder and harder for that to make its way back to the, the um, heart.
So this is most often seen in the legs, but sometimes you can see these things in the esophagus and in the rectum. And the most famous one in the rectum is when you get hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids are basically varices. Uh, under increased pressure, you get this venous network that basically just expands uh, and we get like swollen uh, venous components there. Um, so uh, that's kind of it for your vasculature. So when you are looking at cadaveric images, some of the things I want you to, to note is, um, like I said, arteries are gonna be thick. They hold their shape, so they're a little more rounder. Um, another thing to think about is uh, there's a, I don't know if you call it a mnemonic, but I always try to you know teach people that um, these big medium arteries, medium veins, uh, they kind of follow this uh, van um, approach, which is vein, artery, nerve. So you usually see the artery kind of lodged in the center and the vein is on one side, the nerve is on the other. Um, most of the time the nerve is try, tries to be a little bit deeper to protect it. Um, but in this case, this is the femoral, uh, let's see right here. So femoral vein, femoral artery, femoral nerve uh, in that pattern. So when you're lost and you can see the, all three vessels, just remember your van and you know like, okay, the artery's gotta be in the center. The veins are typically gonna be flatter. They do have that little bluish discoloration. Uh, nerves are also flat, but they kind of have like a shine to them. It's really hard to say, but hopefully you can kind of see the difference there. But keep that in mind when you're looking at cadaveric images. And I think that's something students often uh, struggle with for these. Uh, next, lymphatic system. So lymphatic system is basically like a venous uh, drainage system. What this does is it's gonna take a drainage of all the, the extracellular fluid in the body and bring it back to the body for recycling. So that extracellular fluid is referred to as lymph. So we talked about the capillary beds. Uh, dispelling all their nutrients, all their fluid into the surrounding extracellular space. Um, and so what happens is not all that's gonna make it back in the blood supply. A lot of that just kind of sits there and bathes the cells. Uh, the cells will start in, um, rejecting all their garbage and waste and put that in the lymph. So the lymph is not, it's kind of nasty. Um, it's full of just a lot of uh, debris. Um, it's also tends to be a source of infection because it's just not, you know, a lot of cells are gonna get rid of their infectious bodies or a lot of things are gonna make their way into that extracellular fluid. So the lymph is kind of one of our uh, main um, immune response regions. So uh, a lot of filtration is gonna happen. A lot of uh, lymphocytes, which are our immune cells, are gonna be located in these, this lymphatic system in order to help combat our, um, our, uh, these foreign bodies. So these work very similar to veins. Uh, a lot of times they actually have uh, valves too. So in much the same way, there's no pressure in the lymphatic system. Um, and what happens is the lymph is basically um, gonna make its way through lymphatic vessels, make its way through lymphatic nodes. So um, lymph nodes become very important for things like staging and filtration of blood. Uh, and eventually the, the lymph is gonna make its way back into the venous uh, system and just be recycled, just like everything else. So hopefully it gets cleaned through your lymph nodes, lymphoidic organs. Uh, and structures like that, and then gets jumped into the venous return, and we start the process all over again. Okay, so a couple of key terms to know for your lymphatics is we start with lymphatic plexuses. Well, much like venous plexuses, these are just gonna be a collection of structures uh, or a collection of small um, uh, vessels that just make up a network. So they work like capillary beds and they're actually found among the capillary beds uh, and they're sort of open-ended. So we saw our capillary bed is basically a communication between arterioles and venules. Um, well, that's where your lymphatic plexus starts. So basically just a bunch of these endothelial lined um, vessels, much like capillaries that just start in your capillary bed and then basically just start taking the fluid in as it comes. Those will drain into lymphatic vessels. So these are the ones that's, that contain the valves much like your medium veins. Uh, and they work in a unidirectional pattern. They basically work under the muscular contraction that we saw with veins. And they basically are just gonna keep pumping uh, our uh, lymph back into our blood supply. And then when we get to larger systems, we have the thoracic duct. It's a more common example of this. You can see in the thoracic cavity. Uh, these are gonna be your lymphatic trunks. And so these take a collection of multiple lymphatic vessels and just consolidate them into a, uh, a single regional area and then finally get drained into your, um, your bigger medium arteries there. Uh, along the lymphatic system, there's things like lymph nodes, which you should be mindful of, and those are usually gonna be identifiable masses uh, along the way. Um, and so what happens is a lot of your lymphatic uh, um, cells, lymphocytes uh, that you use for fighting infection are gonna be housed in these lymph nodes. So these become a common source for fighting infection. Uh, and we'll see that that becomes prominent when you're looking at things like swollen lymph nodes or tonsils, which are actually a lymphoid organ, which we'll talk about next, is when they're doing their job, they get swollen because they're fighting off this infection. They, they start generating a lot more cells. 
uh, to fight off this infection, so they just become a little more prominent. So sometimes that's good, the body's doing what it needs to do, but if it keeps doing that, we can find, um, we can see it leads to problems. So lymph organs are gonna be a wide variety of uh, larger structures in the body that generate these lymphocytes and create lymphoid tissue. So the thymus is a common example for uh, children, but most adults do lose their thymus. Tonsils are one of those common ones where uh, if people had swollen tonsils when they were young, it's usually because the lymphatics were just overreactive. Uh, red bone marrow and spleen are also common lymphatic organs. Um, a lot of your GI tract will actually contain things like, they're kind of a mix between lymphoid organs and um, uh, lymph nodes found actually within the muscular layer of your uh, GI tract. Um, and then finally, lymphocytes. So these are your infection-fighting cells, your white blood cells, and these are found typically in lymph nodes, but they can also circulate through the rest of your lymphatics as well as your vascular supply. So once an uh, antigen, which is any sort of foreign tissue, is identified, then what's gonna happen, and I should really step out of the way here, uh, what's gonna happen is the, um, the lymphocytes are gonna be activated and they start going to attack. And you can run into problems where your own lymphocytes don't recognize your cells, and so those can be autoimmune diseases, um, but for the most part, an inflammatory response is these sort of lymphocytes, these red blood cells, um, basically just acting um, against these foreign materials. So a couple of things to think about clinically. So if there is any sort of lack of lymph drainage, we basically see a swelling of the extracellular fluid there, and that's um, known as edema. So you can see in this image here, uh, it's basically peripheral edema. You can kind of compress on the body, and it sort of holds its shape. It's just like this... Um, uh, swole, swollen uh, legs, so people who have had injuries or things like that where there's a lot of uh, uh, reactive tissue there. Sometimes like if you, you know, kind of break your finger or, or you know, cut yourself, a lot of times the body's trying to bring a lot of fluid there real quickly. Um, and so sometimes you get some temporary edema. If a patient were to lose a lymph node region for surgery, maybe there, there were concerns of cancer metastasis, then those areas become at higher risk for uh, edema as well. So sometimes things like compression socks or compression regions can help sort of keep the blood or just keep the, the lymph flowing. We talked about reactive lymph tissue. Uh, so if you've had tonsillitis, this is basically lymph tissue that was uh, hyperactive. Uh, so in the results, um, in the presence of infection, um, and even in some cancer cases, you can get reactive lymph nodes which enlarge. So if you've even had like swollen th throat, sometimes you can feel like enlarged lymph nodes on your um, neck. You have a lot of lymph nodes around your sternocleidomastoid region. And so you can feel those. Uh, this is known as lymphadenitis. It's just a, an inflammation near the lymph, node, lymph nodes or um, adenoids, which is where the, the tonsil regions would be. So these are a collection of lymphoid tissue. Uh, also, the lymphatic system is a, common, <coughs> sorry, is a common mode of spread for cancer tissue. So a lot of times when they're doing cancer resections, they'll actually uh, look at the lymph nodes along that general path just to see if the cancer has gotten into the extracellular fluid and is starting to make its way to the rest of the body through the lymphatic system. So it's common in surgery that they'll go in, you know, particularly in breast cancer, they'll usually take out your axillary uh, lymph node regions, which are everything in your um, uh, armpit area. Uh, take those out and so now you're at increased risk for the drainage of your arm because you don't have a large concentration of your lymphatic drainage here so you can get edema in your arm all right so let's take a look at the integument system that just means skin so this is just something to kind of be mindful of um, i think we take for granted the fact that skin is part of the body and it is in, in fact its own organ uh, we divide the skin up into the epidermis and the dermis so the epidermis is that protective layer on the outside there. So it's got the hair sticking out. It's got um, pretty much just dead keratinized cells. So it's very um, uh, protective. Uh, and it's got a nice little waxy layer uh, from the sebaceous glands that kind of protect it and, and help like water sort of glance off. Uh, the dermis is the layer underneath and that contains all our functional structures. So our blood vessels, our, um, our arterials, our um, uh, nerve endings, things like that. So the reason, the reason we feel stuff, where our hair is growing, that's all in the dermis, which is just underneath. So the epidermis is just that small, thin area. And you can kind of see up here, just this little thin region in your notes. That's the epidermis, meaning on top, and then the dermis is everything underneath. There's also the subcutaneous tissue, or the hypodermis. So if you see this yellowy area underneath here, that's the hypodermis, and that's pretty much all uh, just loose connected tissue, also known as fat. Uh, underneath that, we have layers of fascia. So our um, skin is out on the outside, and then if you were to dissect down into that, you'd get a deep fascia, which is this dense connective tissue area, and you can see that down 
beneath the uh, the body or the uh, hypodermis here. Let's see if my pointer is working. Uh, and this is dense connective tissue. And so when you were to cut down, you can actually kind of, if you get to some certain structures, it's very like prominent. It's this white area, and that sort of separates our skin from our subcutaneous uh, muscular region. Uh, you'll also see investing fascia, which is just fascia that kind of uh, involves the muscular structure. So a lot of our muscles are going to be kind of wrapped up in groups uh, and surrounded by investing fascia. Um, so fascia is just another word for connected tissue. Uh, so even fat is kind of a uh, a fascia, as you can see, they call it superficial fascia. That just uh, kind of is your loose connected tissue, your adipose tissue, things like that. Uh, a couple of key things to note. So uh, most of our body heat is kind of um, insulated through our fat layers. So having um, a healthy layer of a fat around our skin kind of keeps us in insulated during colder times. Um, but we also want to make sure that our body regulates temperature appropriately. And a lot of that is done through the dermis. So our arterioles, uh, they also have these smooth muscle uh, layers in their tunica media. Um, and by expanding and contracting, they can actually regulate the release of heat. So if you are you know, working out and you notice like your arms are getting kind of uh, warm, a lot of times what your body has done is sort of just increased your arterial flow and, and what's gone, uh, what's known as vasodilation. So more blood is coming through, which is allowing more of that um, heat to basically be transferred up to our uh, epidermis and just released that way, uh, or basically be taken off by sweat. So uh, skin, particularly the dermis and hypodermis, are really important for um, temperature regulation. Uh, a couple things to note, uh, clinically speaking, so when we're talking about burns, that's kind of one of the biggest things that you'll see with skin. Uh, we usually denote it based off of whether or not a particular region of the skin is involved. So um, the original terminology was first degree, second degree, and third degree burns. They've kind of moved away from that. So now we talk about things being either superficial burn, which is just you know kind of like a uh, abrasion on your epidermis only. So rug burns, things like that, uh, scrapes. You can get partial thickness if you get the epidermis and then you kind of make your way a little bit into the uh, dermis um, and only just the upper layer. Once you've kind of gone through uh, most of the dermis, you're looking at a full thickness burn and usually those are getting us into the hypodermis or the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, and then if we've basically gotten rid of the entire skin and, and it's um, gone, basically nerve endings, uh, blood supply, everything else that's considered the fourth degree or the entire skin. And so usually you can start seeing like the underlying fascia or even muscular tissue at that point. Um, Interestingly enough, usually at that point, once the burn's kind of set, uh, your nerve endings are gone. So you don't like, it's not necessarily that part is painful, but you can feel the pain from around it. And a lot of these will generate a lot of edema. So what our body's trying to do is bring over nutrients, try to start repairing. So um, a lot of times if you've seen a lot of burns or you get burned, um, you start to see it kind of like uh, get a little more swollen in that region as our body tries to kind of to repair itself. Uh, a couple other things to make note of with the uh, skin is things like Langer lines. So these are uh, tension lines. So our skin kind of flows in these, uh, basically our collagen makes these nice little patterns along the skin. This is very important when we're doing surgery because we wanna make sure that we're um, following the path of these Langer lines. It'll make scar healing a lot more um, manageable, I should say. So um, basically the limbs have these longitudinal uh, spirals. So you can kind of see how it goes from, you know, my shoulder all the way out. So if I were to make a cut kind of here, it'd be along the Langer line. So it means if I were to suture it up this way, it would suture very smoothly. However, if I were to make a cut against that, the skin kind of pulls itself away. So those coll collagen fibers basically just kind of separate themselves. Um, so it runs a little bit differently in the limbs versus when the th uh, in the trunk kind of just runs uh, basically like an axial section there. So if you're looking at the skin in the cadaver, just make sure that you're aware that um, the epidermis is gonna be pretty durable. So you can see the skin is pretty much, what we see as skin is always the epidermis. Um, it's very difficult to cut through. So you gotta use more pressure than you would anticipate. Um, and just be mindful that you wanna try to get into your deep fascia, which means you've gotten through it. A lot of areas, depending on um, the particular body composition, will have a lot of a higher uh, content of hypodermis, so that subcutaneous tissue. Uh, so you just keep working through until you get to that deep fascia. But here you can see we basically cut through the deep fascia, so everything we see down there is our deep fascia. Uh, and then a couple notes on muscles. So muscles are going to be covered uh, predominantly by a lot of your extremity lectures. Um, 
but just be mindful there's a couple different types you'll talk about. So skeletal muscles are pretty much all the named muscles that you'll see in the body. So when you start talking about the muscles of the back, the upper extremity, lower extremity, et cetera, those are all your uh, skeletal muscles. Those are striated, which means they, um, you can kind of just see if we were looking at them microscopically, they have this nice little structured pattern. Um, and it's very similar to cardiac muscles. Cardiac muscles are also um, striated, but as cardiac muscles, they're only found in the myocardium. They're useful for just um, contracting the heart. Uh, and then finally, you have smooth muscles, which are found in all your vis visceral uh, organs. Um, and they're non-striated. They're just kind of this like network of muscular tissue. Uh, the key differences are your skeletal muscles are voluntary. So you can decide whether you want to move them, bicep curls, do push-ups, whatever you want to do, jumping jacks, um, go running. It's all voluntary. But we don't have to think about our cardiac and smooth muscles. We just normally digest food. We just normally our heart beats, our diaphragm works. That's all considered smooth muscles or cardiac muscles, and those are involuntary. Uh, so it just happens without us thinking about them. So when you're looking at uh, muscles, so most of the muscles that you guys are gonna talk about in anatomy are gonna be skeletal muscles. Uh, and when you're identifying them, the way to think about that is your origin is always gonna be the point of the muscle that remains, or the, um, the point of attachment that remains fixed. Uh, and then the muscle's gonna insert on an area that's being moved, right? So when we think about that, like, See if I can get a good example, right? So if I'm trying to move my, um, let's make it bicep, it's real easy. So right, so if I'm gonna use my um, uh, biceps brachialis, if I wanted to basically pull that in, my upper arm is not moving, but the muscle is acting on my forearm. So the origin is gonna be in my upper arm, the insertion is gonna be on my lower arm. So just think about that when you're thinking about how to identify origins versus insertions for your muscles, is what is the part that is being moved because that is gonna be the insertion point. A um, couple of things if you're looking at images, so a lot of times it's difficult to tell the difference between um, a muscle versus connected tissue. Uh, so the muscles are usually gonna have these striated patterns. Like I said, the, the striation from the skeletal muscles is very prominent, uh, and so that's gonna be a mostly dead giveaway. A lot of times you're gonna get that um, investing fascia covering it. Um, so uh, hopefully that gets cleared away, especially in the images you guys will look at. Um, and then you gotta make sure that your connective tissue is usually gonna be a yellowish in color, and it, it gives away pretty easily. Uh, <clears throat> things like um, uh, your vessels, they might be invested in your connective tissue, so it's something that you have to be mindful of when going in there, but usually if you're using a moderate amount of force, it's never really an issue to just kinda like clean them out. Uh, they don't break, but if you're just manhandling them, then yeah, you will probably break an artery or especially some of the smaller nerves. But uh, it's always advised when you're doing cadaver dissection to just not use a scalpel when, um, if you can help it. Uh, just because blunt dissection tends to be a little more worthwhile, you just get rid of some of that fat and everything usually reveals itself uh, gently. So um, that is it for our introduction to vascular supply uh, and everything else. So let me know if you have any questions and I will uh, talk to you guys soon.